Christine, it is such a joy to have you with us. Can you just tell us a little bit about what your life looks like right now? Yeah, Sarah, I'm fired up um, to be across the pond by a screen. And so we, we're doing well. You know, I, my life has got a lot going on. My daughter, my 19-year-old um, daughter just graduated uh, from high school. She's about to go to college. So I'm in that season of life where one's going to college and I've got one at home. And we are just doing a lot of traveling. You know, we run a global anti-human trafficking organization. So we haven't been able to leave this country, but we've got four offices in this country and been doing a lot of our work um, uh, on Zoom. But on the ground, all of our offices have been happening. And here's some good news. Um, in, in many ways, even though we've come out of a global pandemic, we have more survivors of human trafficking in our care now after this year than we have ever had in our 14 year history. And so we saw more rescues, more survivors rescued and more traffickers put in jail over this year. So wow. at the moment, um, despite a lot of the challenges and heartaches, um, we are seeing great breakthroughs in this area. So, you know, we're, we're full speed ahead, full of faith and full of hope. And Christine, you and I got to spend a beautiful morning together in Orange County, California, and you told me about your deep love for England. My friends made fun of me because the question was basically, tell us about your favorite country and why it's England. Uh, but since our viewers are from the UK, just what, what's, what's the heart God's given you for England? Why do you love this country? Yeah, I, I love it on so many levels. Now, of course, my degree is in English literature, so that tells you how much, um, you know, me and Jane Austen would have been besties. Um, or Emily Bronte, or all of them. Okay, so, um, but I have been coming, uh, not, well, my major love is my husband is the, his parents are from England and Ireland, so the UK is kind of my passion. And he has a British passport, so I am married to a man with a British passport. Um, I love all things. I've come, except for this last year, over the last 30 years, I've come several times a year. I love the English countryside. My youngest daughter wants to come and do university in England. She wants to own a quaint bookshop um, in a, you know, in a little village. And that is going to be until she gets into an old house in a little village that has very, that has water problems and has all of the, the historical <laughs> issues. But at this moment, her whole life, is to own a historical home in a village in England, run a bookshop, sip tea, and occasionally drop in on the Queen. So our family is UK obsessed. I live in a 100 year old house and you can just give her a heads up. It's both magical and it's a 100 year old house. So. That's what I keep telling her, honey, you like plumbing, sweetheart. That works all the time, on top. Absolutely. Um, Christine, one of the things I've so valued about our conversations is your combination of honesty and hope. And just would love to ask you, how do you keep your heart focused on hope personally? You know, well, I, Sarah, to be absolutely honest, how I keep my heart uh, anchored in hope is because my hope is actually anchored in Jesus. And so whichever way I slice it up, if I was to have hope in the world alone mm. or uh, people's being good in any way, shape or form. You know, I, I work in anti-slavery. I work in rescuing the victims of human trafficking. So pragmatically, I see the worst of humanity every single day. I see a lot of pain. I see a lot of suffering. I see the depravity of people. I see the evil that is on the earth. There is no, I, I mean, it's daily in my face. We have 15 offices in 15 countries around the world. And we have children in our care as young as 18 months old. So when I see the capacity of what one human being could do to a child, um, that no one can say that I've got my head buried in the sand and I'm not seeing what's going on in the world. In my own life, I, um, you know, I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born. I was uh, the victim of um, sexual abuse for 12 years of my life. So very damaged, very broken, very traumatized. Um, the daughter of Greek immigrants, very marginalized because of my ethnicity and my gender. So I know what it is to be part of a marginalized community. I know what it is to have been abused and misused, uh, to be abandoned and rejected, to not know who my biological parents are. So there is no way that I'm not connected with pain or suffering or loss or grief or trauma, both in my past and in the work that I do in the present on this earth. Um, and yet, 
you go, how can you be hopeful, Christine? Seriously, we're talking about human trafficking and slavery and abuse and abandonment because Jesus mm. is this hope I have as an anchor for my soul, both firm and secure. That's what the, uh, the writer to the book of Hebrews says. And my thing is that um, Jesus really holds. Like a lot of things don't hold. I, I've been hurt by people. People don't hold. I failed myself. I've made mistakes myself. So it's not just everyone out there. I myself am flawed. You can ask my husband. You can ask my children. You can ask people that I've hurt in my life, um, mistakes that I've made at work. Mm. I, I'm flawed. Mm. So I don't have any hope in myself as an anchor. I don't have any hope in people around me. I don't have hope ultimately in the economy. Um, I don't even have ultimate hope in science or technology or the medical profession. I mean, all of us for the last 15 months, a little virus that we could not even see with our own eyes locked us all down. All across, I mean, I've got offices all around the world. Every country was locked down. People were in that. So if our hope ultimately was in medicine or science or technology or the environment or other people, we would be, all be very disappointed. Or even if our hope was in ourselves, we would be very disappointed. Um, but Jesus holds. And here's my deal. An invisible virus that we couldn't see we all trusted that it existed enough that we all locked ourselves in our home because mm. none of us wanted to get it. So I figure a God that is invisible, no one can laugh at me anymore and go, is he your imaginary friend? Do you believe in this invisible God? You're talking about this anchor, Christine. How can he be a pragmatic, practical anchor when he's invisible? I'm like, honey, this little virus locked us all up. Do not talk to me about believing in invisible things. I absolutely believe in an invisible thing. We all do. And so um, if you say to me, truly, is my hope anchored in him? He's, he's not my imaginary friend. He's not this part of my imagination. From my birth, I'm 55 this year. I'm old enough to be everybody's grandmother that is watching this. Um, and, you know, Jesus holds. That's the, that, that way. So when you go, my hope transcends this world mm. and yet the fact that i have hope in the life to come gives me such hope to wake up every day and proactively work in this world to bring beauty and love and kindness and goodness so hopelessness i think leads to paralysis and inactivity you'd rather stick your head in the sand or after what we've seen with racial injustice and pain and suffering and loss and grief especially this last year um, it would just be easier to put your hands up and go, it's just too hard, man. It's, and coming out of quarantine, you're like, what am I actually walking back into? But when you have, if you set your minds on things above, your hope transcends this temporal world. For me, that doesn't cause an abdication of responsibility. That causes an engagement with this world in many ways. Amen. And Christine, you and I are both passionate about Jesus Christ being the anchor of our souls, and we found him beautiful in his word. And so we're going to look at a little passage together from Romans, and uh, you're really kindly going to read it for us. Romans chapter 5, oh, yeah. verses 1 to 5. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, I love this. Uh, scripture says in, in verse 1, verses 1 to 5, therefore, I love it. Okay. Sorry, the preacher in me now wants to start, but I'll just read the text. Okay, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We could just land there for the whole next hour. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Here we go. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Christine. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Preach this text to us. What 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 is it well, saying to us today? Well, every I mean I mean you could just go every bit. A lot of us are going. You know, I think I might have lost you when I got to the fact that not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. You were tracking with me when we were justified by faith, when we would have peace with God. Who doesn't want peace with God? Who doesn't want your forgives? Uh, you've sins forgiven. Who doesn't want to live just as if I had never sinned? 
yes, tick the box. Yes, I get peace in this very chaotic world. Um, you know, and that we've entered into this grace in which we stand like you mm. go, awesome. We love all of that. We love grace. We love faith. We love justification. I know you're all really pumped. <laughs> then we get to that word that says we rejoice in our sufferings. And you're like, Chris Kane, you have just lost me right at this point. And, um, you know, and I think about that. I think like when the pandemic happened and uh, we had to have all of our offices on Zoom calls, just like I'm coming into you today um, on Zoom. I called it the upper Zoom room. <laughs> for year. We were in the upper Zoom. And so we would be up there. And I would say, well, look, guys, Jesus warned us that in this world, you will have suffering. You will have tribulation. So mm -hmm. anybody that's ever told you that Christians believe that there's no suffering or no pain or we're kind of ignorant, we live in this ignorant bliss, they're not telling you the truth because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that in this world, you will have trials. You will have suffering. In fact, um, Peter wrote and he said, do not be surprised when these fiery trials come upon you. And so I remember saying that to our team. I'm going, I don't know why everyone's freaking out because Pete said, don't be surprised. Now, James went one step further. He said, I'm not with James. James said, consider it pure joy. And I'm like, James, you consider it pure joy. I'm not considering a pure joy when we experience suffering. So what I want you all to know is there is a theme. So Romans, Paul, when Paul's writing this, he says, look, there's a reason. And how many of us would not want a reason mm. after the last year to go somehow? I, and I know I'm not minimizing or, or diminishing or dismissing. There's so much pain. So many of you, you've lost loved ones like what we have. Um, you've suffered yourself in your physical body. Uh, my husband had COVID and, and was um, sick. I had a friend just two weeks ago in hospital and we thought we were going to lose her. So I understand the pain, the loss, the grief. Many of you have lost jobs, have lost income, are wondering, uh, you've lost your business. You're wondering what is going to happen. You're like, Chris, you're, you sound so hope-filled. But here is the reality of my loss and my pain and my grief and my suffering. But Paul doesn't just, God's not a sadomasochist. He's not like, oh, I'm getting great joy because you're suffering. I want mm. you to know there's a because. When you understand the because it doesn't make the same listen it doesn't make the suffering any better any easier um it, it but it, it gives us some meaning and purpose to it and he goes on and he says we rejoice in our sufferings knowing this is the production and this is what i'm believing for all of us coming out of this COVID season that suffering produces endurance now if you're under 30 right now listening to me you're like Endurance is highly overrated. Can I just tell you at 55, it's not overrated. And if you live long enough, like all you have to do is not die. If you don't die, you're going to get to 55 as well. So I'm just telling you, endurance will be a very, very important quality that when you're young, you don't realize the power of it. When you get to my age, you're like, oh, you need endurance. It goes on. And endurance produces character. Mm. Now, again, in our very Instagrammable, nicely filtered, nicely edited life, we go, what does character matter? I'll just shove a filter on it. I'll just shove a, uh, you know, I'll just edit that. I'll crop that. A character doesn't matter. I'm just going to build my platform based on my gift, based on my talent, based on my context. Um, can I just tell you that your gift and your talent might take you somewhere, but it's only your character that will ever keep you there. Mm. And uh, what we have seen across the world over the last few years is so many prominent people who were very gifted and very talented in every sphere of life, whether it's in the financial realm, whether it's celebrities, actors, sports stars, uh, business moguls, um, and yet we've seen them just fall because they had no character. They were either living double lives, they were either um, they lacked integrity when it came to their marriage, their relationships, their families, the way they navigated finances, the way they represented their corporation. And so we've seen it in every realm of life. It may take a lot of years, but eventually your character will reveal you. So you need endurance in order to have character. And you don't get endurance when everything's going great. You get endurance when everything's not going great. You don't even know what endurance is 
until you have to endure. And you never have to endure when something's just a whole lot of fun. When everything's like a party, you're not like, when you're young and partying, it's not an endurance. You're like, I'm up, I'm having a ball, this is easy, I love my job, I love my friends, I love making a whole lot of money. And then suddenly, your boss comes down on you and says, you know, that you're not working great. Suddenly, you hit some kind of financial crisis. You've got to take a, a drop in income. Suddenly, someone else gets the promotion and you don't. Suddenly, someone gets the credit for something that you don't get and you did the job. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, your friend betrays you or leaves you or sleeps with your girlfriend and you're like, what just happened? When that happens, that's the only time that you go, man, are you going to endure? Mm. Is your faith going to endure? Mm. Is your character, is your integrity going to endure? So you, you'll never know it while everything's going great. It's only when something, when you get disappointed, when you get discouraged, when you lose something or someone, mm. when grief sets in and you don't understand what's hope happening in your emotions, in your life, that is the time when you will need endurance. You don't need to endure until you need to endure, and then you need endurance. So he says, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So what can you ascertain from all this? You can ascertain that I've gone through a lot of suffering that has refined my character, mm. that has produced endurance, and then you go, oh, that's why she's got hope. There is this progression that happens. We want the hope, and so often we just confuse optimism with hope. So if we think we're happy and the glass is half full, but that's the, that's more like going to you know some sort of casino and kind of like I'm optimistic, man. I'm going to win the lottery today. That that's how most Christians think that hope is. Mm. That you know somehow I'm going to get this sort of this thing's going to fall out of the sky. I'm going to get a lucky break. So we confuse optimism and luck with hope. Mm. But hope is a result of suffering, character, endurance, and then you have hope. And then of course the Bible says our hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately, that ultimate hope, you rest in the love of God. You rest in the grace of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God. So no matter what happens, you know that you are his beloved. Mm -hmm. You know that that anchor is secure. You know that whatever happens in this world, this is not the end. This is not all there is. And that there is significance and security. There is value. There is meaning beyond the here and now. But you've got to remember the progression. Mm. Suffering, character, endurance, hope. What we've all just had in this last year, and this will be the last thing I say about this, is I know it might not seem like it right at this moment, mm. but it will seem like it when you get older and in years to come. We just had an accelerated season. So instead of like going to school where you start in kindergarten, you go right through elementary and middle school, then you get to high school, then you go to university. This last year, we just went from kindergarten to university in a year. Mm. We just did a fast track of suffering to get endurance, to get character, to get hope. So that the fact is, if you allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in our hearts through this experience, we can have fast tracked what may have taken us 20 years to develop in our Christian life just got developed in a year, mm. which means we are more prepared for fruitfulness now than we were at the beginning of 2020 and that we might have been in 2030 because we allowed the Holy Spirit to do something through that suffering that grew our character, that led to endurance, that brought hope into our life, which means we've actually got something to offer this world. As the world opens again, and we go into it, we're going to go through with a different hope that we never had before. And it's the only hope that will ultimately matter to a world that is so hopeless in this hour. Christine, amen, hallelujah, that'll preach. <laughs> okay. One of the beautiful ideas in this passage is that hope either, your translation says, doesn't put us to shame. Some translations say, don't disappoint. If there's those who would just honestly say, gosh, this year I either felt the weight of disappointment or I don't know how to overcome places that I'm just ashamed of, what would you say to those? You know, I, I want you to know that um, here's the biggest thing, especially for so many of you struggling with shame, and this has been the biggest struggle of my entire Christian life. Uh, that comes with 12 years of sexual abuse, being abandoned when you're born, 
Um, so way before a global pandemic and loss and mistakes and grief, it was my battle. But can I just say, it's actually everyone's battle. You just think in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, which is the very last verse of the chapter before the fall of humanity. So it's an important verse because straight after this, we go into here's where everything tanked. So the very last verse says, Adam and Eve were naked and listen to these words, and they knew no shame. It is interesting to me that out of everything God could have told us, he could have said they knew no joy or no anger or no offense or no greed or no love. He could have picked anything, pick the plethora of human emotions, pick the plethora of human experience, but there's one thing that God wanted us to know before the fall. There is one thing I don't want you to know what it feels like, and that's shame. Mm-hmm. You and I, as image bearers, Genesis 1, we were created in the image of God, male and female. He created us. As image bearers, the last thing God wanted us to know before the fall was that we would know no shame. Mm-hmm. So if I was the enemy, <laughs> I'm not, but if I was... And I wanted to take out the only thing created in the image of God, the only thing that God loved so much with the love that he loves all each and every one of us. If I wanted to take them out, I would try to put on them the weight of something they were never designed to carry the burden of. We were never designed to, not, to know what shame felt like or to carry the burden of shame. So as the enemy comes into the garden, What is the thing that he's going to put? If Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame, the first thing that he's going to try to do is make them ashamed. And of course, that's where Genesis 3 goes. Ultimately, when the Lord comes into the garden and the first words, we see God speak. The first question God asks in all scripture is, where are you? And Adam responds, you know, I was naked and afraid. And so I hid. Fear, shame, hiding right there. First question from God to humanity. First answer, fear, shame, hiding. I want you to know it's not a new thing in 2021. It's an original thing right there from Genesis 3. So the enemy just finds new ways of the same old thing. Let's get us into fear. Let's get us into shame. Let's get us hiding. Let's get us pulled back. Let's get us not trusting God. Let's get us running from God rather than to God. It has always been his modus operandi. It always will be his modus operandi. So we think, if I failed, I can't run to God. If I've sinned, I can't run to God. If I've messed up, I can't run to God. If I feel disappointed, I can't run to God. Or if I feel lost or grief or anger or bitterness, I can't run to God. That is the plan of the enemy. Whereas God's saying, bring it all to me. Bring it all to me. In fact, the second thing question he asked, first one is, where are you? And I think he's asking that of us even now, coming out of COVID. Mm. Where are you? Where are you? It's okay. I'm still here. Where are you? And then the second question he says is, who told you? Mm -hmm. So you've got to ask yourself, what is the lie that I believed? And for me, that lie I believed in my early life was I believed the lies of the abusers Mm -hmm. that told me it was worth nothing, that through their actions told me that I had no dignity. I had no value. They dehumanized me through both their actions and their words. So Who told me? I believed the lie that they had told me. I believed the lie that I was worth nothing because my biological mother abandoned me. I believed the lie that I was worth nothing because my birth certificate has no name on it. I believed the lie that I'm a failure because I failed. (laughs) I believed the lie that I'm a mistake because I made mistakes. And so, so I believed the lie of the teacher in my second grade class that wrote on my report card, Christine has to learn that she can't always be the leader. She talks too much in class. Well, that took 20 years off my life. That one thing that I read when I was nine years old made me think there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. I'm too bossy. I'm too strong. I'm too... So that made me pull back. And that's what the enemy wants us to do in every area. Don't take risks. Pull back. Limit yourself. Minimize yourself. He'll use, unfortunately, parents, friends, teachers people that abuse you, what he wants to do is minimize you. And that's what he wants us. He wants us to believe the lies coming out of this pandemic. And that we've all been online more than ever. We've been listening to a whole lot of stuff more than ever. And this is the deal. When you make what someone says to you or says about you bigger than what Jesus did for you at Calvary, you will 
always believe that lie and it will limit you and contain you. And so Jesus came to take shame off us. He bore our shame on the cross at Calvary. He bore our guilt. He bore our sin and our iniquity. There is no better news. Listen, this, I've got nothing better for you. I don't know what you've got going for you that's better than that on this earth today. No amount of money is going to give you that peace. No amount of money is going to give you that forgiveness. No position, no title, no person, no accolades. No matter what you accumulate, nothing is going to give you the peace of God that can only be found in and through a relationship with Jesus. And so a lot of us are coming out of this pandemic and some you know, some things were taken from us out of our control. Some of us have lost so much. Um, but you, you, you can, when I say lay that at the feet of Jesus, I mean, lay the shame, the guilt, the condemnation, um, the pain, the suffering. And then you can pick up that hope that is yours in him. That hope is the thing that gives you a promise to look towards the future. I'd say, and I know right now, if you're in the middle of a lot of loss and grief, it's hard to see, but what the enemy has tried to steal from us more than anything else in this season, more than stuff or jobs or positions or titles, is hope. Because if he can rob us from thinking that there is any hope for the future, then he has got us. That paralyzes you, that cripples you. That's what he wants. I need you to know that more than more than your stuff. The devil doesn't need your stuff. He doesn't need your car. He doesn't drive. So that you don't have to worry about that. He's not looking for that. What he wants is your hope. He mm. wants your faith. Those two, if he can take faith and hope, then you're not going to get out of bed with any sense of future. And the whole gospel is the hopeful gospel. That's the, the resurrection hope that we have, that there's a new day to come. There's a new day dawning, that with Jesus, there's always new beginnings, that his mercies are new every morning. It's actually the central message of the Christian message mm. of what the enemy wants to do is rob your hope. That's why this conversation which is becoming more like a monologue i'm so sorry everyone i'm greek sarah's you know this is what happens when you interview a group um, but the monologue what 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 i want to talk to you all at creation first about is i want you to not be ignorant of the, the enemy's devices the enemy wants your hope and your faith and christine uh we want a monologue in jesus name amen but i, I think as we close <laughs> out this conversation one of the things I love about this passage is that God has already poured out his love into the heart, into our hearts by his Holy Spirit, which he has given to us. And I would love it if you would just pray for those who are watching, for those who are listening, for those who are receiving this content. The word that I think is actually going to be a significant one for someone who's watching is that little word about 20 years of your life, having been robbed by someone who spoke less than hope over you. And would love it if you could just pray over anyone who is watching this today that we'd receive the love of God, the gift of the Spirit, and that we would know Jesus in this transformative way. Amen. So, Father, I, I thank you. I thank you for every single person on the other side of this screen. I thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much. I thank you that there is nothing, nothing that we could do, think, or say that could separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, absolutely nothing. So I pray even now, even now that people would feel and sense the palpable presence and love and grace and mercy of God wherever they are at, Lord. In, do what only you can do, Holy Spirit, in people's hearts in this moment. Only you, only you can do this. And Lord, there are many watching that feel like their life has been loved. There have been words of death spoken over their life. There has been damage done to them. And Lord, they feel like I have lost, I've lost a decade, I've lost two decades, I've lost three decades. I thank you, Father, mm. that you are the God that renews, that redeems, that restores. You can restore the years that the canker worm has stolen, Father. You are able to do miracles. Like truly, Father, I believe you can do miracles. And, and, and overnight, you could do what 20 years of damage did. Literally, Father, I'm the recipient of that. I, I, I shouldn't be here today. I shouldn't be filled with hope today. But God, mm. but God. Jesus, you are so real. You redeem and you restore. And Father, you do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that we could ever ask, hope or think. So Father, I pray you would do a, a healing, a deep healing work in people's hearts and people's lives right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we are created by you for a relationship with you. And it's Jesus that connects us to you. So Father, anyone watching this that does not know you, 
I pray that their heart is quickened, even in this moment, to reach out and have a relationship with you, Jesus, who connects us to God and his love and his grace and his mercy. Let people truly encounter the, the life-saving power of God, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. So I pray healing. I pray redemption. Mm. I pray salvation. Mm. I pray hope, Father. I speak hope over every single person on the other side of this screen. And I believe that you are the God of miracles. And Father, whatever has been lost, whatever has been mm. stolen by the enemy, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would restore double, Father, double in people's lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer for the first time today, we've got a beautiful website page called What's Next, and we'd love to have you visit it and just embark on your faith journey or wherever you're at in your faith journey, discover more of who Jesus is. As Christine and I would both say, his name is like honey on our lips. His spirit's like water to our souls. Christine, before you leave us, you've written a book. Yes. Tell us about the book. Okay. I will, um, and I just happen to have it. Okay, everyone. It's called, How Did I Get Here? Finding your way back to God when everything seems to be pulling you away. I think a question we're probably all asking coming out, we're probably going, how did I get here? See, all of us are somewhere where we didn't think we would be right now. And um, in that, I really just talk about how so many of us, and, and I start with a very honest story that happened to me 2016, 2017, um, where we drift. And I think a lot of us are struggling with the drift right now, either drifting from church, drifting from Jesus, drifting from hope, and, um, you know, the, the book is a hope-filled but extremely transparent, not sugarcoating anything, going, okay, basically, what do you do? How do you come back to God when you feel like drifted? Dr you've drifted. How do you stop drifting? How do you stop yourself from drifting if you haven't drifted yet? Um, and is there hope for us drifters? I want you to know there is hope, and so I'm praying that the book really ministers to people. Christine, I can't wait to read it. And as a fun little fact for the day, if you check the website for How Did I Get Here, you'll see not just wherever books are sold, but you'll see more places that books are sold than even I knew existed in the world. And, and I'm a reader, so I think there's like 40 outlets placed where people, you can pick up the book. It's like everywhere. I know you can get, I mean, you're going to, you couldn't trip over not finding this book. <laughs> Christine, it has been such a joy to have you with us. We honor and bless you. And your life is such a gift, not just to uh, myself and Creation Fest, but to the whole of the UK and indeed the wider world. So we just want to say thank you for being who you are and Jesus and proclaiming this message of hope over us. Love you guys so much.